Hello, my name is Chris. I'm a paramedic and an instructor here at Idaho Medical Academy, or IMA. Uh, today we're going to be talking about EMS systems. So when we're talking about EMS in general, it is important for us to understand that we are part of a system. We're not just, just our ambulance or just our fire engine or whatever it is. We're part of this whole overarching system uh, that starts from when somebody's injured or sick all the way up until they get discharged from the hospital. Uh, so we're going to be made up of a couple different teams of medical providers. There's going to be the fire engine possibly that's going to have a couple EMTs, paramedics, EMRs on it. There's going to be the ambulance service that again maybe has a paramedic or an EMT. That's pretty standard. Uh, and then we're going to have the hospital as well. And the hospital is going to have nurses and physicians and surgeons and everything there. So it's really all of us working together as a team that's going to make this system all work. Um, the point of EMS, probably why you're here, is because we provide uh, emergency care and transport. So EMS is who shows up when you call 911. Sometimes that's linked to the fire department, sometimes that's a totally separate thing. Typically the ambulance service for most places is separate from the fire department, which surprises a lot of people. Uh, we're not necessarily falling under that same umbrella or same departments, but uh, when you call 911, it's uh, EMS that shows up to, to take care of that patient and to transport them to the hospital if they need to go to the hospital. Uh, EMS has a couple different overseeing governing bodies. Uh, typically, the state is going to make most of the regulations that you will work under if you are an EMS provider. So you're here to take this course so that you can become an EMT. It's important for you to understand that just finishing this course does not make you an EMT. Um, the, the main oversight committee, or whatever you want to call it, is for EMTs is going to be the NREMT, or the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians. Once you finish your EMT course, and this goes for any EMT course, uh, once you finish your course, that will just allow you to take your national registry exam. Um, once you have taken that national registry exam, that's when you can start to try to get jobs. Some states will have their own certification exam. Typically they don't, and that is the entire point of the national registry exam. National registry is a certificate that tells the different state governing bodies of EMS, this person has achieved this certain level of education, and that way that state We'll just accept that without requiring any more examinations or any more courses or anything like that. That's not always the case. There are some states that will require you to do their own exams, uh, maybe some, some optional additional education as well. Uh, but generally, that's, that's kind of how it works. You get your national registry, and then you can start to apply for jobs uh, or possibly apply for your state certification. Uh, Idaho is a little particular. Um, we're in Idaho, um, here at IMA obviously. Idaho, you need to have become affiliated with a department before you are able to become licensed for the state. That's not always the case. There's a lot of states that will allow you to get your state license. And you might even need uh, a county license uh, beyond that to work in that certain area. Uh, it's really important for you to make sure that you look into the laws and the regulations for the area that you want to work so that you know what you need to do to go get a job and to start working. Uh, it's also important to understand that difference between certification and licensure. Certification means you have done uh, this amount of schooling or you have had this certain education that does not allow you to practice medicine or to work in the field. And this will be, we'll go way more into this down the line, uh, but having a, a good baseline understanding of it, it's good uh, just to keep going throughout the rest of the course. So um, your certification does not allow you to work as an EMT. Again, it just means this person has achieved this certain level of education and should know enough to go get their license. And the license is what actually allows you to practice medicine wherever you are. Um, and we'll get into it more a little bit here later, but the licensure falls under a medical directorate. 
And so that's what's important that we're working under a doctor's medical license when we are licensed as EMS providers. So most states have four different levels, basic levels of EMS providers. There's going to be the EMR or the emergency medical responder. Then you're going to have the EMT and that's the course that you're in, the emergency medical technician. Uh, and that's generally the, the baseline for most professional EMS is going to be the EMTs. Uh, EMRs are more typically um, a volunteer type level of certification. Uh, so you'll see that a lot in more rural fire departments. They might have EMRs instead of EMTs uh, just because it's a little, little more basic schooling and a little more accessible for a lot of people that aren't doing this professionally. Uh, there's also the AEMT or the advanced EMT and then the top level is going to be the paramedic and there's places you can go beyond that. Uh, you can get your critical care paramedic um, or other different further certifications, but these are the four basic levels that we see here in EMS. So like I said, an EMR has very basic training. Um, they, a lot of the time you might see the other first responders have EMR training, uh, especially again in more rural areas that don't have as many responders in general. So you might see uh, sheriff department personnel or police department personnel that have been trained at the EMR level just so they can, they can treat a patient while they're waiting for maybe a volunteer ambulance service to get people to the ambulance and to the call. Um, they may assist in ambulances. You might see some places that use EMRs to drive the ambulance so that they can have that extra set of hands that has some training there. Uh, but a lot of the time, like I said before, the EMR level is going to be um, typically non-professional volunteer EMS personnel. The EMT has that basic life support training. Uh, so going through this course, you're going to learn about some basic airway maneuvers with airway adjuncts. Uh, you're going to learn how to operate the AED. That's one thing that we're really good at in EMS is cardiac arrest and, and managing that. And the, the foundation of that is really good BLS EMT care. Uh, you're going to learn about giving some certain medications and when you can give those and why you can give those. Uh, it's a definite step up from the EMR. Um, EMTs really start to learn a little bit about the body and the body's processes and why we're doing what we're doing. EMR is a little bit more in this situation, we do these things. EMT, there's, it goes further in as, and this situation is going on, we're going to do these things and here is why. So it's definitely a step up and like I said, EMT is kind of the baseline for most professional EMS. The advanced is going to work off of the EMT level of training and just go a little bit further. Uh, the real big difference generally between an advanced EMT and a basic EMT is the skills that they're allowed to perform. Uh, an advanced EMT can do uh, IV therapy. Um, they may have a little bit more on the medication side, a few more medications they can give. Uh, they also do IOs or intraosseous, which is essentially an IV into the bone cavity. Um, they do a little bit more uh, high-level airway um, maneuvers, so there's, there's a little bit more to it, but it's still pretty grounded at the, the basic EMT level. And then when you get to the paramedic level, that's where the, the scope really opens up. Um, I've worked as an EMT and I've worked as a paramedic. Um, I've been working in EMS for about 12 years. Um, as an EMT, you're generally going to have about five medications that you can administer and a lot of the time those are helping that patient to administer the medication they've already had. Typically, if you're going to give nitroglycerin for somebody with chest pain, that patient needs to be prescribed that medication already and you're just going to assist them in that situation. Uh, whereas a paramedic, working as a paramedic, my drug box had somewhere around 40 medications. Uh, and you have the freedom to give those medications much more readily than you would at the EMT level because your training is, is significantly higher. Uh, you, the paramedic level is going to know a lot about cardiac monitoring. We're going to do EKGs, 12 leads, and actually interpret that information to decide if somebody's having a heart attack or what's going on with their heart. Um, really significant airway maneuvers, including endotracheal intubation. So the paramedic level is... 
uh, is going to be much more in that ALS realm. So a lot more that can be done in a lot more different situations, but it comes with a lot more training as well. So the EMT course is broken down into two major sections. You'll see there's kind of four things up here, but there's really two major sections. Uh, you're going to have your didactic work or your book work. Not really book work these days. Um, we, you'll have a book, of course, but for the most part, people do most stuff computer-based. So, but we still say book work. Um, and then you're going to have the skill side of things. So uh, those are a little bit different, but they definitely work together to really teach you uh, all the information that you need to know. So there's a big aspect of you maybe learning about cervical spinal injuries and what happens if somebody hurts their cervical spine. And then you're going to learn how to put on a, a cervical collar to protect that spine um, and how to put them on a backboard and move them and all those sorts of things. So those two portions of the course do come together to make you a functioning EMT. Um, you're also going to be doing a number of patient scenarios and that's really what takes everything that you're learning in the classroom and ties it all together. So uh, you'll have a mannequin with a proctor or you'll have another student pretending to be a patient or, or whatever we're doing. We do a little bit of uh, VR in the classroom as well sometimes when we are able to. Um, so you might see some VR patients. Um, but you're going to have a patient scenario where you're given a patient is having chest pain or a patient's having difficulty breathing and you're going to have to work through an assessment to find out what's going on with that patient and how best to treat that patient. And so that's really going to be the culmination of everything that you're learning throughout this course so that you understand the disease process and the pathophysiology of what's going on with that patient and you can determine the right actions to take to help that patient, um, which is really fun. It's what, it's what we're here for. Um, it's the most fun to put everything together and once it all starts really clicking for you is when you're going to start to have a good time in this course. So EMTs are the backbone of EMS here in the U.S. and that's really true and if you're from a um, more major metropolitan area uh, like we are even here in Boise, it's not a huge city but it's still a, a pretty major city, um, that might kind of sound weird to you because we're used to hearing about paramedics and paramedics doing all these things and for the majority of the U.S. that's just not the case. Paramedics are not cheap. We're expensive. Having an EMS system is not cheap. And so uh, in you know middle America or most places that just can't support having multiple paramedics on an ambulance, uh, EMTs are going to fill in that role um, for the most part. So EMTs really are the backbone of what we do uh, in the EMS system. Um, and you'll also hear, if you go down the paramedic route or if you have a good paramedic partner, uh, you'll hear the term uh, BLS before ALS all the time. And really, the best paramedics are really good EMTs that add on to it. So really having that good backbone of the BLS level is what makes your ALS provider really a sound good provider. Uh, and obviously, EMTs provide um, emergency care to the sick and injured. So uh, we, re we really do a lot more than that, as you'll start to see when you go out there uh, and start to work in the field. But that's the basis of what we do here uh, in the EMS system. So as far as getting your license, uh, you're really going to need to look more specifically into where you're trying to work to see what that, that's going to require. But typically, you're going to need a high school education, GED, uh, diploma, something along those lines. Uh, there are some states that may require higher levels of education. I don't think they're doing it anymore, but I know at one point Oregon required all EMS personnel to have an associate's degree. Um, so that is a possibility that you need to make sure that you're looking into uh, if you're going to try to work in a certain area. Make sure that you just know what the education requirements are to get that state license. Um, immunization is possible. Um, I know that's a hot topic, especially we're recording this in 2022, and so we've been going through the COVID pandemic with all the COVID immunization, um, but that's going to be something that you might see at different departments, that there might be certain immunization requirements. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, you're also going to have to do a background check and a drug screening. Remember that we are going into people's homes, and they're putting their complete and utter trust in us. So at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, grandma fell down and she's calling us to come into her home and help her out. Um, and she needs to have the trust in first responders that 
nothing's going to go missing. There's nothing like that, right? And so uh, you're going to have to make sure that you have to do a background check and a drug screen before you can get your state license. Um, and it's usually a, a high level federal background check. So, um, you know, we're the public is putting a lot of trust into us, so they need to vet us and make sure that we are uh, we are able to give that trust back to our community. Uh, and then a driver's license, obviously. For the most part, we're gonna be driving different vehicles to get to these scenes. So uh, typically, if you're gonna work on an ambulance, you need a driver's license so that you can drive that ambulance on public roads, and same thing on the fire service. Um, I know down in California, they have a specific ambulance driver's license, so you might have to go a little further uh, as far as the driver's license requirements. But you will need a valid driver's license, typically, to work anywhere and to get your state EMT license. Uh, you're going to have to successfully complete a course, which is why you're here. You're going to have to complete this course so that you can get that national registry certification to allow you to get your state license. Uh, you need to be able to show that you have the physical and mental capabilities to perform the job. Uh, most EMS departments and definitely fire departments are going to put you through some sort of physical agility testing uh, before you can get hired. And it's usually not super strenuous, but this job can be very physical. Once you've done CPR a couple times, even on a mannequin, you realize how physically demanding that is. And we need to carry heavy equipment. We might need to move uh, unconscious patient down some stairs or down a hallway or whatever it is. And so you typically will have to uh, go through and do some sort of physical agility testing to get hired by most departments. Uh, and that might be part of the state licensing requirements as well, but usually that's going to be more on a department basis. Uh, and then there might be other state, local, uh, or employer provisions that you're going to have to follow. Again, a lot of this is just finding where you are, where you want to work, and seeing what's required there so that you can make sure you're hitting all those certain things. And of course, this is uh, a profession that's going to follow ADA to the best of their abilities. Um, so if you fall under any of the ADA stuff, again, just kind of look into to you personally and how that's going to affect you. But typically, um, they may try to require, or sorry, they may try to modify a certain working environment to make it work uh, for certain responders. Uh, and again, background checks like we talked about before, uh, that's a big thing that you're going to have to be ready for. So just expect to have to do a background check uh, to get your state license. So the history of EMS, uh, we just, in the modern world, we expect that we can call 911 and if we're sick or injured, an ambulance is going to show up and that's typically what we expect, especially um, in more populated areas that have those good EMS services. But obviously that was not always the case. Uh, actually not even the case for the most part until maybe the 60s or 70s. So um, a lot of EMS started off taking uh, stuff from the military and how the military did things and bringing that on to the civilian side. So from the world wars, uh, from Korea, all those things is where we started to learn how to do these emergency uh, medical transport type things. Um, where they would take soldiers to battlefield hospitals. Uh, we started to integrate that into the civilian side um, to, to help people, you know, instead of a soldier that got hurt, now we have maybe somebody that fell down a flight of stairs and we need to give them that same care. So, but the origins for the most part are, uh, are actually from the military. Uh, at some point, they realized that there was a deficiency and there was no structure really or anything if, if people got hurt. Uh, and I, I think a lot of this actually came from automobile accidents. You know, as we went from horse and buggies, uh, low mechanism of injury, slower speeds, to starting to have vehicles that were going 65 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour, and getting into those accidents, uh, there was the recognition of a need for somebody to help out in those situations to get those patients to the hospital. Uh, the DOT published the first EMT curriculum in the early 70s. Uh, it's kind of surprising to most people, but the National Highway Traffic Safety Association, I believe is the NHTSA, um, is the, the general federal oversight for EMS. Uh, it's not really a medical thing, it's actually 
uh, traffic safety. So um, it's kind of surprising to some people that the DOT, the Department of Transportation, is, is kind of what pushed a lot of this, uh, a lot of this to start going. Um, and so there weren't even EMTs until the 70s. There weren't even paramedics until then uh, on the civilian side. So like I said, we're, we haven't been around as long as you would think. We just expect this to be something that happens. And uh, up until the 70s, there, there wasn't this structure of emergency medical services. Um, in the 80s is where they started to advance the levels. Um, and we've been slowly building uh, on those building blocks to get where we are today. Um, if you work in this career for any amount of time, you're going to start to see some changes. Uh, and that's, that's typically a good thing. There's definitely a learning curve that we've been going through uh, of learning how to best deploy EMS and how to make it best work for the community. And we're constantly updating that, uh, which is why you see in 2019, uh, the NHTSA released the EMS agenda for 2050. So just trying to keep furthering uh, EMS to make us just even better for our communities. So we touched on this a little bit already, but there's different levels of training and different kind of levels of certification. So I like to think of these kind of as, as umbrellas that get smaller and smaller. So you're going to have the federal level. Um, and so that's what dictates that level of training. And that's what EMT programs like us are going to fall under. So uh, and our EMT is the governing, or sorry, the, or the certification body for EMTs. But at the, the federal level, um, there's that national EMS scope of practice model. And that says, here are the things that an EMT should know. Uh, and that's kind of what designates the entire big umbrella. And then stepping down, it's going to be the state level. And typically, those states will say, an EMT learns all of these things. We want them to know this much of it um, and be really good at this much of it. So uh, they might pare down a little bit of that, that big umbrella to a little bit of a smaller amount of information or different training. Uh, and then we can work our way down to the local level. Uh, and that's where you're going to have a medical director who has oversight over that EMS system. Uh, so here locally in Boise, we're in Ada County. Uh, and Ada County has a pretty cool EMS system where all the EMS ambulance services and all the fire departments are under uh, the same medical direction. Um, and so there's actually two medical directors here in uh, Ada County for the access system is what they call it, Ada County uh, something EMS. I don't remember off the top of my head what it stands for. Um, but there's a medical director that oversees all of that. So that medical director can see, especially if we're talking about like the paramedic level, that um, at the state level, paramedics are allowed to administer 75 medications or whatever the number is. Those medical directors then come in and say, well, I like these 50 medications. And so that's what we're going to allow providers to give here in my, in my county, um, at my local level. So again, federal level, huge, state a little smaller. Um, and then we get a little bit smaller at the local level. Uh, and the local level could be a uh, county, it could be um, a city, it, it could be a specific department has their own medical director. Uh, so you're just going to have to figure that out once you get hired somewhere, kind of how the medical directorate thing works. And we'll go much more significantly into medical direction uh, down the line. Uh, one of the, the things that's important for us to do here in EMS um, is to really teach the public a little bit about what we do and to get the public's help in that. And so we see that a lot with the, there's been a big BLS push to teach uh, just the general public CPR um, because they found if that, that gets started early, that the success rate and the likelihood of somebody coming through that is significantly higher. So um, you're, we're starting to have a big push and we've had a big push for a while to really get hands-on CPR training for a lot of lay people. Uh, and AEDs as well, that's really the two things that are important in somebody in cardiac arrest are good quality CPR and early defibrillation with an, with an AED. So if you look around, you might not have noticed it because why would you? But if you start to look around, if you're at the mall, I guarantee you, you can find an AED probably somewhere at the mall. If you're going to a gym, there's probably an AED at your gym. Schools are gonna have AEDs. 
Um, they're, they're just around. And so that's been a big, uh, a big push to get the public a little bit better trained on those things so uh, that we can all kind of work together to have good outcomes for people. So we already talked a little, about, a little bit about EMRs. Uh, a lot of the time they're just going to give that, that basic first on care until a higher level can show up. So this is the rollover accident that highway patrol or state police get there first. Uh, they can start some basic um, life-saving maneuvers if they need to uh, while they're waiting for EMTs or paramedics or just a higher level of care to get there. Uh, EMTs are going to be that next level, like I said, typically the first level of professional EMS responders. Um, the course that you guys are in right now, uh, the course are normally 150 to 200 hours. Um, that's going to be encompassing of, of everything, right? That's going to be clinical time if you have clinical time, all your classroom time, all your studying at home. Uh, it's, it's a lot of hours. Um, and if you guys have looked at your book yet, it's like that big, so it makes sense that it's, it's a lot of hours. Um, and it's going to typically be the EMT level that's going to take care of that patient, package that patient, and transport them on to where they're going to the hospital. Uh, like we talked about before, uh, the, the AEMT is going to be kind of the same base of knowledge, just a little bit further. You know, the EMT scratches the surface of a lot of stuff. The advance is going to go that next level down, uh, and then more skills. Uh, typically, an advanced course is maybe 120 hours or so, uh, whereas the basic course is 150 to 200. Uh, the advanced course is maybe a little bit shorter or, or close to the same amount of time. Uh, there is a lot of comprehensive review on the BLS uh, basic EMT stuff as well. So. Um, I know our course here, we expect it to be about three to four months for the advanced EMTs. Uh, and then paramedics is a much, much longer course. Um, typically, most schools for paramedic school are going to be about a year to a year and a half. I know locally here in Boise, ISU is going to be our, our local paramedic program. Uh, and that is about a year and a half between all the didactic book work, the classroom work, to everything else. So I think that they do nine months, I believe, of book didactic classroom work, and that's three days a week, I think eight hour days, so about 24 hours a week uh, of actual in the classroom for nine months. Uh, and then what really sets the paramedic level apart is the amount of clinical experience that you get before you can get that, uh, that school completion. So. Um, Typically, you're going to have about 240 plus hours in the hospital uh, at the paramedic level. Um, so I know I did 20 12-hour hospital shifts between different various departments, uh, obviously the emergency room, and then you might be able to go uh, work in the, the, uh, the OR for a little bit and get some experience in surgery to get to do some of those skills, uh, probably labor and delivery. Uh, so hopefully you get some experience with the, the, the labor and delivery side. So on the paramedic level, there's about, like I said, about 240 hours of, uh, of clinical time in the hospital. And then your field internship is typically 24, 24 hour shifts or uh, 48, 12 hour shifts. So it's around 500 hours. Um, so uh, it says 1,000 to 1,300 hours I'd say honestly, it's probably a lot more for most programs, because um, just just your clinical time is not super far off from a thousand. So uh, it's a much longer program, much more comprehensive. Uh, typically, you need to at least have your basic EMT certification to even apply for paramedic schools. Uh, but like we said before, it's going to be a much wider range of ALS skills. Uh, so those things at the EMT level kind of scratches the surface. It's it's a deep dive into those things. You're really going to start to get a pretty profound understanding of the different body systems and the different disease processes and how those things all work. So the components of the EMS system, um, it's got a bunch of different words followed by care here. Um, but we're going to be looking for really quality care for people. Uh, Evidence-based clinical care, uh, we've seen a big push for that um, in the I don't know how many years, but fairly recently in the world of EMS to really try to be evidence-based. Uh, even when I started back in the day, it was, you know, 
Bubba did this and it worked really well that one time, so now everyone's gonna do that with no real evidence to back that up. And now we're really trying to be evidence-based about what we're doing as far as our, our medicine. So that if we're gonna give this medication, it's because there's been a lot of studies and trials that we know this medication works for that, that certain thing that we're doing. So um, evidence-based medicine is, is really starting to be a big thing that we're seeing in EMS. Uh, preventative care is something that uh, we try to get out to the public. Um, we're starting to see a lot of what they call community paramedicine. And so that is paramedics and there's actually some EMTs. I know uh, Idaho has community EMTs in the more rural areas that don't have paramedics uh, that go and, and work more on the preventative care side. So they do uh, medication reconciliation with patients to see maybe they're on multiple medications for the same thing because the, the cardiologist and the primary care doctor aren't communicating very well and so they're on two different low blood pressure medications and now they're tired all the time because their blood pressures are lower than they should be. Um, so uh, community paramedicine can kind of help with that. Um, they'll do a lot of uh, liaison work between patients and different services, um, especially for at-risk populations like the elderly, uh, to get them the help that they need. So uh, there's there's definitely a, a growing wave of preventative care that we're trying to do here in EMS. Um, and then patient records is always an interesting thing. You guys will see about HIPAA if you don't know about HIPAA already. But that can have some effect on the patient records. Um, but it's definitely something we're trying to work for to make this entire system work. So that we show up on a call with a patient who's having a stroke we take that patient to a stroke center, drop them off at the hospital, and then we can get that good feedback. Um, and so the patient has that comprehensive paper trail and everything is there going through their entire patient care process. And we can learn from that as well so that next time we're on that same call, we can do it better. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot of that with the patient records of uh, hopefully everywhere. Uh, I know we're, we're seeing it a lot here um, locally of a little bit of a better relationship with the hospitals and EMS um, so that that's a, a more comprehensive thing and we talk to each other a little bit better. So for public access, hopefully you've never had to call 911, but there is a likelihood that you have at some point. Um, but we have the 911 system here in America. Uh, obviously, if you go to different countries, it might be different. Um, the number you would dial might be different on the phone, but here we have uh, 911 system, so if there's an emergency, you dial 911. Uh, some places even have 911 text messaging. Um, I know that that's a, I think that typically stems from, you know, maybe a stroke patient that's not able to talk or on the kind of the more law enforcement side, maybe somebody's um, hiding in their home because there's a home invader. They're able to, to send a text message to 911. So that's definitely something that we're starting to see. Um, so when you call 911, you're going to have a dispatcher on the other end that's going to pick up the phone and answer. And their job is to find out what resources uh, need to be sent to that scene. Um, we need to remember, once we start to do the, e the job of EMS, that dispatch is receiving information from non-medical trained personnel. So sometimes that information and sometimes the resources that get dispatched because of that information isn't exactly what we would want, but it's really everybody doing their best to try to get the, the right things there. Um, there's also the EMD system that may give some medical instruction. It's pretty common now if somebody calls in and they're calling about somebody in cardiac arrest, for those dispatchers to actually help walk them through hands-only CPR so they can get hopefully some even if it's not professional level quality that we would deliver once we get there, at least there's some level of CPR being given to that patient um, almost immediately. So we're starting to see that a lot, which is, is really, really good. Uh, and there's even some different apps. Uh, I know locally we have one called Pulse Point that you can download if you're CPR certified. Um, and it will, uh, will kind of track your information. Sounds kind of ominous and scary, but um, it will kind of be looking for you, and if a call goes out close to you that requires CPR, it will actually ping you and say, hey, there's somebody, you know, in this business next to the restaurant that you're at, 
um, and there was a call that this person needs CPR. You signed up for this as CPR trained. Can you go over there and help them out? So um, we're really starting to work on this, this public access to get not just EMS involved, but hopefully everybody involved to help in these, these high-level situations. So like we said a little bit ago and we talked a little bit about, we've got uh, medical direction. So that is kind of our, I don't even know, our, our Bible, I guess, um, of what we're going to be able to do in the field. Um, like I said, there's, there's a federal level, there's a state level, and maybe at the, the state level you're allowed to do a certain thing. Um, or maybe we see that a lot. We have a couple instructors here that uh, work on the military side as medics as well. And so even though some of them are EMT basic certified, in the military they're allowed to do a lot of high level uh, procedures for trauma patients. Uh, maybe a surgical cricothyrotomy where um, if somebody has an airway obstruction or something they can actually cut a hole, an opening in the throat to put a breathing tube in. That is not allowed on the civilian side. Um, so even though they're trained on that, on the civilian side, working under that medical direction, they can't do that skill because it doesn't fall under that, that jurisdiction of their, their license that they're working under for that specific area, that specific medical direction. Um, medical directors a lot of the time also act as a bit of a liaison. Uh, they're usually, medical directors are usually pulled from a local hospital system. Uh, so if you're dropping off patients at, you know, hospital XYZ, hopefully uh, you have a medical director who's from that hospital who can kind of work as a liaison between maybe the trauma teams to help improve your trauma care or the stroke teams or the cath lab or whoever it is uh, so that you can kind of integrate better with those hospitals. It's good to have that liaison. And then we have our standing orders and our protocols. Um, so that is going to kind of describe the care that we can do. Uh, like I said, it's kind of our our Bible. I guess that's more our Bible than the medical director, but uh, it's, it's what we're allowed to do um, and what skills, what medications, all of that uh, is going to be spelled out in our standing orders and our protocols. Uh, there's two different types of protocols. There's going to be offline, we tend, tend to call them standing written orders, and then online medical direction. So offline essentially says, in this situation, you can do those things. We don't need to talk to anybody else. We don't need to call a doctor or anything like that. If somebody is having chest pain, we can give them aspirin. It's written down in our, um, our book of protocols, and we know we, know we can do that uh, without that, that actual um, in-the-moment oversight. Uh, and then there's direct orders or online orders. So that would say, in this situation, you can do these things with an order from a physician. So um, you're on this call and you need to do this procedure or give this medication. You'll just have to call the hospital, talk to a doctor, typically a physician. Sometimes maybe there's just a nurse um, that is able to give you those orders. But you'll talk to somebody on the phone or on the radio, say, here's the situation I have. For these reasons, I think I need to do this thing or give this medication, and you'll get the approval from the doctor. So uh, it's something you've already been trained on and you should know about, but they're typically um, a little bit uh, higher risk procedures or medications or whatever it is, and so they want um, a little bit of extra in the moment um, oversight for you. And some of this is really going to be based off of the system that you work in. Um, there's some systems that are, are much more heavily dependent on the online medical orders where you're going to have to call in for a lot of what you do. Um, there's some systems where, like that here in, um, in the Boise area, that we have very, very little direct oversight. Um, most of what we do is going to be those offline orders. So uh, it, it's really just how the medical director wants things to run. Um, so you'll find out once you get hired somewhere, you will really need to study your protocols and you'll start to see what's online or offline medical, director, medical direction orders. Um, our training and our protocols, like we said before, are going to kind of follow some sort of um, state legislation. Uh, a lot of the time the states will say EMTs need this amount of continuing education or those kind of things or what training they need. So 
Um, it's again stuff you'll find out once you kind of start working. Uh, and then typically um, senior EMS officials are going to handle uh, the administrative tasks. It's pretty common for most places that uh, those administration roles are filled by former field personnel. So, and they're going to do scheduling, budgeting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, typically, um, they are people who have worked in the field before uh, and kind of get, get hired up from there. And we talked about this a little bit already, but that integration of the health services is a really important thing and something I personally have seen a big push for uh, where I've worked um, in the different systems I worked at is getting better and better. So uh, it's always important to understand that pre-hospital care, what we do is not where it ends and it keeps, to, keeps going after we drop people off of the hospital. Um, so having that, that good integration between EMS and the emergency department, emergency room, um, and then even further down the hospital, uh, that's really important for, for good patient care. And that's really what we're here for, right, is just that good quality patient care. Um, and so uh, the integration of all the health services is an important thing uh, that hopefully will continue to progress and really just have a really good integrated healthcare system top to bottom for when people call 911. Uh, mobile integrated healthcare. Uh, this is what I talked about a little bit before with those community paramedics. Um, it's still a fairly new thing. I personally am not super well versed in it. I haven't taken any of those courses or ever worked as a community paramedic or done any of the mobile integrated healthcare. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much on it just because I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough about it. Uh, but it's, it's starting to be a thing in a lot of places. So, um, you know, wherever you end up, your department might have something like that. So it's a good idea to to try to look into that where, where you're going to be working to see what they have to offer as far as it. Um, but it, it is a lot of using EMS personnel outside of just 911 emergency type stuff. Um, there's, I know that there's some places that have PAs that will do kind of house calls for patients that don't need to go to the hospital. Because uh, we take a lot of patients to the hospital that don't necessarily need a hospital. We're just not able to give them the care that they need. Um, so there's, there's patients that maybe they just have a stomach bug and they don't need to go to the ER, but if we have this good mobile integrated healthcare, somebody can go to them and they can treat them at home and so it's a little bit less stress on the system. So uh, this is what we're really starting to see in some places um, start to expand. Uh, and it really, it's a fairly new thing. Um, very, very new. As you saw earlier, EMS is new in general, so this level of EMS is really, really in its infancy. So we'll see that for the most part now, um, all the documentation of patient care, all that stuff is typically gonna be uh, computerized and we're gonna have electronic patient care reports or EPCRs. Um, there might be some places that still do paper. Uh, most places will at least back things up on paper if you need to. Uh, so I know I've, I've typically had some old paper forms just in case my tablet fell out of the ambulance and broke or whatever it is. So um, those aren't necessarily totally gone, but for the most part, everybody now is using um, electronic documentation. So it just makes everything easier to manage on the billing side uh, and on that, that, good, can, that good continuity, continuity of patient care. Um, the electronic PCRs really allow us to, to gather data about what we're doing and how we're doing it so that we can improve uh, our patient care down the line. Uh, the medical direction is typically going to be responsible for that quality control um, and this is really going to depend on where you work and, and how they do things. Um, but I know the access system, like I was saying here, locally uh, in the Boise area of Idaho, um, they have a really robust um, QI, QA department and every single chart that's written on the medical side in our county is read by somebody secondarily after the call. Um, and then there are a number of different call types that the medical directors read all of those different charts. So um, there, there should hopefully be in most places some good oversight just to make sure that everybody is doing the right thing. And if you have a really involved medical director, uh, they're going to be able to give you that good feedback on those, those calls because it's not uncommon for us to run a call and do what we think is right, but we're not sure if we did the right thing. 
And so having this, uh, these evaluations are really good. It can seem really scary, uh, but it's the best way for us to improve. Um, and then just culture is something that we're starting to hear a lot in EMS. Um, just culture uh, is really just trying to, to play fair with everybody uh, and have accountability for everybody all together. But uh, that's a term that you might see more, uh, more commonly throughout your career. Uh, so quality improvement, kind of like I talked about a little bit already, um, it's just going to kind of look at what we're doing and evaluate that to see if there's anything that we can, any ways we can do things better. Um, minimizing errors is a huge thing for EMS. You know, you might be on a 24-hour shift or a 48-hour shift, and you might be on hour 42 of your 48-hour shift, and you've only slept for two hours because you're on a busy state at a busy station. And so, being able to minimize errors in that those types of situations are really important. The errors that we make could have profound effects on somebody's life uh, going forward. So um, it's really important for us to have that, that quality, or sorry, continuous quality improvement um, so that we can kind of look at what we're doing. How, can, how are we doing it this way? How can we improve it? So hopefully um, we can be better responders for our community that we're serving. Uh, patient safety kind of fits right in with that. Um, obviously patient safety is a huge thing. Um, and so we're, we're constantly trying to look at ways that we can improve uh, patient safety, whether it's um, improved seat belts on the gurney for that patient in the ambulance, or it's a different process for doing medications, or whatever it is. We're constantly looking at ways to make things uh, more safe for our patients. And that's going to require the efforts of the entire agency and the personnel that's actually boots on the ground as well. So that's going to be you as a provider making sure that you're doing your, your six rights of medications, which you guys will learn later, um, and keeping up with your training so that you're doing things the right way, not you know, being on your cell phone while you're driving or whatever it is. Uh, and it's going to be requiring the EMS agency, the, the entire system as well, to look at those things and have protocols and procedures that are going to help to have uh, patient safety in mind. Uh, system finance. This is going to be very different, or could be very different, dependent on um, what your department is and how your department's funded. There's, there's tax base, there's private services, there's volunteer services. Um, could be a mix of those. Um, I know locally, Ada County Paramedics uh, is the largest EMS organization, well, transport organization in Idaho. Um, and they are what's called a third service. So they are county employees and they do receive some tax income, but they're also uh, bill for service. So they, were, they get income in that way. So there's some places that are strictly, EMS is a private service that's strictly bill for service and don't get any uh, tax income. There's some places where it's all tax based. Uh, it really is just gonna depend on where you are. Um, on the finance side for those who are doing the job, the EMTs, uh, there might be a couple of things that you're going to be asked to do, including uh, getting insurance information. Um, and that's just to help expedite that process because it's not cheap, obviously, to run these, these ambulances, these fire engines, whatever it is. Um, and so there needs to be some sort of funding to keep the lights on uh, and make sure that somebody shows up. So it can seem kind of silly when you're out there you're out there to save lives and you're having to get insurance information, but that's what really keeps the system rolling down the line. Uh, getting signatures, um, HIPAA signatures, uh, permission to bill, insurance signatures, whatever signatures you're gonna need to get. Um, these are things that are actually very important for what we're doing. Um, you're not here to learn about getting signatures, and I understand that, but um, we can't continue to go on these calls uh, if the, we, if your system is not able to financially support itself. So these things are very important. And there's always a question, of course, of where this money is going to come from and how we're going to progress. Uh, and so this talks a little bit about one way, which is the, um, the CMS, the EET3, uh, which helps to pay uh, providers and systems for, for doing the proper treatment. So 
Um, this, is, this is a constant discussion uh, if you get into this field of how are we going to fund these things and how are we going to progress. And so this, this is one way that it, they're kind of looking at, but uh, these things could change. Um, typically, you're not going to be too worried about that just at the EMT level if you're just working on a fire engine or on an ambulance. Uh, but as you go through your career, if you start to progress, uh, the financial side is going to be a little bit more important for you to understand. So, but again, things could change very quickly on this as far as how that goes. So, uh, like I've said a bunch of times now, just try to look into your specific area where you're working to get an idea of, of the financial things if that's something that's, that's interesting to you. Uh, on the education side, um, we have our EMS instructors, which is me. Um, in most states, they are licensed. I am uh, licensed through the state of Idaho as an EMS instructor. Uh, that's not always the case, but that, that is a possibility that that might be the case where you're at. Like I said, here in Idaho, lead instructors need to have their, their state lead EMS instructor certification. Um, we're going to follow different national standards. Uh, like I talked about before, there is um, a national standard of what we need to teach and what level we need to teach those things to that we're going to follow and every, every EMS uh, education institution should do the same. Uh, and then there's going to be CE hours. Um, I don't remember the number of hours offhand for the different levels, uh, but I believe at the basic EMT level every two years to keep your national registry certification is 40 hours of CE or continuing education. Um, and so those could be all sorts of different things. Um, you have to take your CPR every two years. That counts as continuing education. Or you can do ALS level uh, courses like um, PHTLS or PALS or ACLS. Or there's a number of different kind of um, predetermined courses you can take if you like to do that. Uh, a lot of people do CE hours because they're going to school to become a nurse or be, they want to be a doctor or to go into paramedic school. And so taking anatomy and physiology through your local college, those hours typically count as well. So uh, there's, there's a number of different ways you can get your CE hours. A lot of departments, if you're working at a department, will give you some of those CE hours. Um, so you'll do specific department trainings um, that will, will count those hours for you. Um, but you need to do those certain hours and that's typically not just the national side. That's usually the state level side to keep your license up. You're going to have to do a certain amount of hours. So again, uh, once you get hired, just look into that. Or once you get your state license, try to find those CE requirements so that you can start that early. You don't want to get a notification that you're about to lapse on your, on your license a month away and you, you need to do 40 hours of continuing education. So, uh, try to find out about that early so that you can start to keep it up and, and really just be the best, uh, best first responder you can be. So we've talked a little bit about this already, but um, public education is a big thing. Uh, like I said, a lot of places will do um, free training for hands-on CPR, or you might have heard of a stop the bleed class. That's another common thing, uh, which is just basic bleeding control uh, because sometimes that's when minutes matter is somebody who's bleeding or somebody who's in cardiac arrest. So we see a lot of that um, public education. Um, we're starting to be pushed out. Uh, and then there's the prevention side as well. Um, so EMS as a system trying to have some public education on prevention, um, you know, like better diets or taking medications as needed or helping somebody who's diabetic to learn about insulin and how that reacts with their body. So there's a lot of preventative stuff that EMS systems and healthcare in general tries to do for the public. Uh, here's a couple different um, ways that uh, the health system has tried to do some of this preventative stuff. So uh, things like helmet laws or tobacco use laws. You know, you can't smoke in restaurants or planes anymore. Um, and so as they track those things, the instances of lung cancer have gone down. So uh, these are just some of the, the things that we've seen um, on a national or local scale that have uh, maybe had some impact, but it's really about that prevention. So like I talked about a little bit before, uh, EMS is trying to be much more evidence-based now. Um, 
So we're really trying to look at different science, different research, and let that determine what we're doing uh, in the field and base our protocols and our practices around those things. Um, if you talk to somebody who's been doing this a long time, they can tell you how much CPR has changed probably since they started. Um, CPR has changed massively as we've found what works better. We've kind of narrowed that down, and so we're trying to teach uh, just those best practices as we find those best practices. So a gr good example is most layperson CPR now is hands-only CPR uh, because they found the breathing aspect is not very important compared to the compressions aspect. And so you guys will go through a BLS course. You guys will learn 30 to 2 uh, with the rescue breathing during the CPR. Uh, but most lay people, they, they don't worry about that um, because they've found through different evidence-based research that uh, if we focus just on the compressions for a lay person, that the success rates of getting ROSC or return of spontaneous circulation or the person getting a pulse back uh, is much higher. So. Um, that's just one example, but there's definitely a push uh, for that evidence-based research, uh, sorry, evidence-based medicine. And so that research is really going to help to shape the future of EMS, uh, which I think is really exciting because we get to be part of that all the time. Um, when I first started paramedic school, um, the department that I did my internship at was doing, a, doing some research on a medication called TXA which is something that's given in patients with significant bleeding. And so, you know, I thought it was, personally, I thought it was really cool to be part of this, this research uh, to a medication that most places weren't carrying yet. Um, so that, that could be the case for you where you work, that there might be some studies that you're going to be part of or something to, to help to determine the future of EMS everywhere. Uh, and some, some departments are a little more forward thinking. Some departments are a little more conservative about stuff. Um, if you look at like King County EMS up in Washington, they're typically considered kind of the pioneers of some, some EMS stuff, so they're, they're pretty progressive. So uh, it might depend on where you're at, um, but once you get into this, if that's something you're really into, uh, you can look into what departments are really progressive and, and kind of go there and try to work there. Uh, so roles and responsibilities, uh, a lot of this should be pretty straightforward but uh, we want to keep our vehicles and our equipment ready. Um, we're emergency services. And so when someone calls 911 because uh, you know, their kid fell out of a window, we can't tell them, hang on a minute, I need to check my bags and make sure I have everything before I go. So that's typically the first thing we're going to do on every shift uh, is to show up and to check our equipment, make sure all our equipment's in working order and we have everything we need. Um, understanding uh, how to work all that stuff, um, your emergency vehicle, how all that works, how to drive with the lights and sirens, all that's really important. Um, On-scene leadership is really a big deal. Um, if you're in class with me, you might hear me say, be the duck. I love to say, be the duck. Uh, because when you show up on that scene of a rollover accident with four patients who are in critical condition, and there's 10 different cars that stop to help and everyone's freaking out because there's four patients laying on the ground bleeding uh, you need to be that on-scene leadership i say be the duck because if you look at a duck out on the water above the water they're calm and serene below the water they're kicking like crazy right um, so be the duck you need to be that on-scene leadership even if inside you're freaking out and this is a scary thing for you you need to be that leadership to calm everything down uh, and make sure everything goes smoothly um, additional resources are always something for us to think about. Um, at the EMT level, you're always going to be thinking, do I need ALS? Um, but it goes way beyond that. Is there somebody with a gun and we need law enforcement? Are there power lines down and we need the electric company to come shut that off or make that safe so we can get the patient out of that car? Uh, kind of whatever it is, there's, there's a whole lot of different resources we need to be thinking about. Do we need to call a helicopter in? That's a pretty common thing a lot of different places um, to do uh, helicopter transport. So. Uh, lots of us to think about. And obviously, uh, patient assessment um, and then the, the medical care is kind of why we're here. This is what we're really learning about in your EMT course here. Uh, emotional support can be a big thing. Um, you'd be surprised at how many calls you go on. That's that really all people seem to need is just kind of someone to hold their hand and tell them that 
that they're okay. Um, so that's that's a common thing we all, everyone that's done this long enough time has had the, the call or heard about the call where they just showed up because, you know, somebody, there's a little old lady and her husband died recently and she's struggling because she can't change a light bulb out. And so she calls 911 and, and we all show up and, and give that kind of help. So it's not always this flashy, crazy medical care. Sometimes it's just some basic, uh, basic emotional support um, or just some of that, that love out to the community that we need to give. Um, most of this, like I said, is pretty straightforward. Uh, ensure and protect patient privacy. Uh, that's obviously an important thing. Um, not only is it important just on the eth ethical side, but there are lots of laws involved with that as well. So uh, make sure that we're, we're protecting our patient's privacy. If you had to call 911, you probably wouldn't want everybody to know what happened. So, you know, think about that as far as your patients. Um, yeah, like I said, most of this is straightforward. Um, community, community relations are really big. Um, I don't know that there's anything I liked more on the job or have liked in the past on the job of having a, a car pull up to me with a really excited little kid waving to me. Oh, it's, it's like the coolest thing, right? And um, being able to have those good community relations is, is really, really helpful. Uh, and then giving back to the profession is important as well. Um, I'm obviously a little biased because I'm an EMS instructor, uh, but I think that that really is part of what we should all be here for. Um, and I know it's been really, for me, it's been kind of my favorite thing that I've done. I've, I've been teaching for five years or so now, um, and I was uh, a field training officer um, at the department I worked at. So I've had students who came in, kind of sat right here in front of me, uh, as in, not physically here at a different, a different location, but um, as EMT students, I taught their EMT class, and a couple years after that, they came to me as field paramedics to be trained in the field by me actually on the job. Um, and that's probably the most rewarding thing I've ever had in my professional career, is to have been part of somebody's journey from, I want to do this thing, to being a good professional paramedic. Um, so I think giving back to the profession uh, is a huge thing, and, and really, to me, one of the most rewarding things that we can do. So professional attributes, um, we need to remember that we're calling people maybe on the worst day of their life. And so when you show up, you want to be the person that would show up for you in that situation. Uh, and that goes pretty deep into, into everything, right? You need to have integrity. You just need to be, be that person they can rely on. Um, you want to look like somebody that they can put their trust in. Uh, we've got you know, a picture of this guy here. He looks good, right? His, his shirt looks good, tucked in, he's well, well groomed. Um, those things signal a lot to our patients when we show up. And so, um, you know, we don't want to come in looking like a slob. If, if my kid was hurt and I called and somebody showed up with stains all over their shirt and they're not clean shaven, I'm not going to have the trust of somebody that walks in and, and really looks the part. So just a silly thing, uh, but keep that in mind. Uh, and self-confidence as well, like I was talking about be the duck. Even if you're not necessarily feeling it, sometimes you are, you are the rock in that situation for everybody else to hold on to, right? And so um, at least exuding the self-confidence, even though it's maybe not there, and it probably won't be there at first, uh, which is okay. That's totally expected. Everybody goes through that. This is a hard job. It takes a lot of time to learn. Um, but kind of exuding that for everybody else can be really, uh, have a really profound effect on a scene. Uh, time management is pretty important. Um, you'll hear about the golden, the golden hour or the platinum 10 minutes in trauma of getting you know, patients loaded and en route to the hospital within 10 minutes of scene time, right? Um, and getting them to a surgical suite within an hour if they need it. That's the golden hour. So time management is important because uh, we could have all these things we need to do uh, to help save this patient's life in a short amount of time to do them. So being good at that uh, is really important. Uh, communication is huge. Um, I say it all the time to students. Our job, we feel like our job is this cool, life-saving stuff. Really, our job, for the most part, is just having a conversation with people. The conversation that we're having is usually based around their medical complaints. But really, 
I'm going to show up on scene to somebody who's having chest pain, and I'm just going to ask them a bunch of questions and have a conversation based off of the reason they called so that I can get the information that I need. So uh, being a good, a good communicator is really, really important for being a good EMS, uh, EMS professional. Uh, teamwork as well is huge. Um, we've all been on the call where there's uh, you know, an uh, obese patient who's at the bottom of stairs and we need to move this patient who weighs 400 pounds up a set of stairs. We can't do that by ourselves. We're going to need a whole team to do that. Uh, CPR is another thing. You know, when, when we're doing CPR, there's five people typically, uh, at least locally, um, three, three fire personnel and two ambulance personnel working on that person. And having that good teamwork really, really, really uh, makes everything run smoother and really gives that patient the best experience. So teamwork is huge. I, I say all the time that what we do here is a team sport. We're not just, it's not just us. Um, being a patient advocate is important as well. Uh, that can mean a lot of different things in different situations, but at the end of the day, you're there for your patients, and that should be your number one thing. That's why you should be showing up every day, is to take good care of that, pa that patient that you're going to go see later. And then remember that every patient is going to be entitled to uh, that best care. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they've called four times already that day. And if you've done this job for any amount of time, you've, you've seen those patients. Um, whatever the situation, if you, we can't have any prejudice uh, based off somebody's socioeconomic status, their race, anything like that. Then that's, that can't happen here, right? Every patient deserves uh, the best care, no matter what the situation is. Um, and then it's important for us to understand that patient uh, confidentiality side and to understand um, and follow those HIPAA requirements. All right, so that was EMS Systems. Hopefully that gives you um, a good first peek into uh, the world of EMS. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to your instructor. Thank you.